Welcome back to the Techmoto channel and the electronics playlist. Today we're going to be looking at transistors. Transistors are the fundamental building block of modern electronic devices and revolutionize the field of electronics. But what are they made of and how do they work? And that's what we're going to go through today in this video. Most transistors are made up of very pure silicon or germanium, but other types of semiconductor materials can also be used. But what is a semiconductor? To understand this, we need to go back to the atom, and on this occasion, we're going to use silicon as our material. Here is a representation of a silicon atom. Now, a silicon atom has 14 protons and 14 electrons, but we're going to focus on the four electrons in its outer shell. The outermost shell of the silicon atom can hold up to eight electrons. And so the silicon atom needs four more electrons to become most stable. Now, if we add in a few more silicon atoms around the outside of the original atom, you can see that the silicon atom forms four covalent bonds with the four neighboring atoms. In covalent bonding, each outer electron is shared by two atoms. What this means is that all of the outer electrons are tightly bound to the nucleus of the atoms because the sharing of electrons with neighboring atoms. In intrinsic semiconductors, the free electrons are not present at absolute zero temperature, and therefore this material behaves as a perfect insulator. And so here lies the beauty of semiconductors, because you can change the behavior of silicon and turn it into a conductor by doping it. To dope silicon, you mix a small amount of an impurity into the silicon crystal. For the purposes of electronics, there are two types of impurities, the N-type and the P-type. In n-type doping, phosphorus or arsenic is added to the silicon in small quantities. Phosphorus and arsenic each have five outer electrons, and so they're out of place when they get into the silicon lattice. This fifth electron has nothing to bond to, so it is free to move around. It takes only a small quantity of the impurity to create enough free electrons to allow electric current to flow through the silicon. n-type silicon is a good conductor. In p-type doping, boron or gallium is the dopant. Boron and gallium each only have three outer electrons, and when mixed into the silicon lattice, they form holes in the lattice where a silicon electron has nothing to bond to. The absence of an electron creates the effect of a positive charge, hence the name P-type. These holes can conduct current. A hole happily accepts an electron from a neighbor, moving the hole over a space. This means that a minute amount of either N-type or P-type doping turns a silicon crystal from a good insulator into a viable, if not brilliant, conductor, hence the name semiconductor. Now whilst N-type and P-type silicon are not that amazing by themselves, when you actually put them together you get some very interesting behaviour at the junction between the two, and that's what we use for diodes and transistors. We're going to start our exploration of transistors by first looking at a diode, which is the simplest semiconductor device. The diode allows current to flow through it in one direction, but not in the other direction. The way this works is when you put an N-type and a P-type silicon together, as shown in this diagram. Even though the N-type silicon by itself is a conductor and the P-type silicon by itself is a conductor, the combination shown in the diagram does not conduct any electricity. The negative electrons in the N-type silicon get attracted to the positive terminal of the battery. The positive holes in the P-type silicon get attracted to the negative terminal of the battery, and so no current flows across the junction. If you flip the battery around, the diode conducts electricity just fine. The free electrons of the N-type silicon are repelled by the negative terminal of the battery. The holes in the P-type silicon are repelled by the positive terminal. At the junction between the N-type and the P-type silicon, holes and free electrons meet. The electrons fill the holes. These holes and free electrons cease to exist, and new holes and electrons spring up to take their place. The effect is that current flows through the junction. A transistor is created by using three layers rather than the two layers used in a diode. You can create either an NPN or a PNP sandwich. You can think of a transistor as two diodes back to back. You'd imagine that no current could flow through the transistor because back to back diodes would block current in both ways, and this is very much true. However, when you apply a small current to the center layer of the sandwich, a much larger current can flow through the sandwich as a whole. So the next step is to see how this works as a transistor. First, we take our sandwiched doped material in an NPN format. Then we connect a battery, and we connect the terminals of the battery to either side of our materials. At this point, no current is flowing, as previously described, as the small layer of positive material sandwiched between the negative material is stopping the current flow. By adding a secondary battery with the negative terminal connected to the common negative and the positive terminal connected to the positive material, we can allow the electrons to flow through the semiconductor material. 
This allows a small number of electrons to pass from the negative material on the left hand side into the secondary battery, causing a flow of electrons through the positive material, which then, as a byproduct, allows the electrons to pass through the positive material to the negative material on the right hand side and back to the primary battery. Now an important concept here is only a small amount of electrons are flowing through the secondary battery, but that small amount of electrons is causing a larger amount of current to flow through the primary battery. When we remove our secondary power source, the current flow stops completely. And so introducing a small amount of current with a secondary source is said to amplify our current flow. These three pins going into our semiconductor material which makes up our transistor are labelled collector, base and emitter. And if we spin our semiconductor materials round 90 degrees and we replace it with the transistor schematic symbol, you can see how it works. If we put this into a circuit diagram with a motor, you can see that a small amount of current applied at the base allows a larger amount of current to flow from the collector to the emitter and through our load, therefore amplifying the circuit and spinning the motor. If you wanted to amplify the signal even further, you can use two transistors as what's known as a Darlington pair. So that's transistors in under 10 minutes. If you have any questions, please do leave them in the comments section below. In future videos, we'll be looking at different types of transistors and how they're used in different scenarios. But for now, please do throw me a thumbs up, please do subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.